We are back in session. And at this time, uh, the agenda item that we had tabled, O-19, uh, I move to on table. We have a motion and a second by Councillor Benton. Any questions? See none, all those in favor, signify by saying yes. yes. Those opposed say no, that passes. Uh, we are back on O-19. Mr. Zaman. Dominic, can I have one of those? Um, Mr. Mr. President, counselors, in, in response to the uh, request from Councillor Gibson and, and from Councillor Pena, uh, we went upstairs and, and um, put our heads together and tried to come up with something that uh, that would be the equivalent of a wage guarantee, um, but that we could get uh, we could get approved by uh, folks up the line at Top Golf this evening. And so, uh, this this amendment language uh, is what we came up with. I'd like to bounce it off you. Uh, amendment one in the PPA attached to FSO 1819, strike the existing section 4B on page seven which is the section that deals with wages and benefits, and insert in lieu thereof wages and benefits. The company anticipates that the jobs shall fall within wage ranges that have a weighted average beginning on the second anniversary of the grand opening of an amount per hour to be determined as such time based on the average wage history from the first two years of operation of the Top Golf facility with wages, uh, I, I, apologize, that's a typo, anticipated to be consistent with the wages listed in the project application. The failure of which shall trigger a performance clawback on the same pro rata basis as set forth in the chart below in section 5C. Uh, that is one long sentence and a, and a real short one, but the upshot of it is that um, the idea is to track the, the wage performance of Top Golf over the first two years of its operation calculate that on a weighted average, compare that to what was projected in, in the project application, and depending on if um, the projections are higher or lower, if they're, if they're higher, there would be no clawback. If they're lower uh, in, in significant amounts, um, uh, as, as described in Section 5C, then uh, there would be a clawback of up to $40,000 per year. Thank you, Mr. Zaman. Uh, Councillor Gibson, you're sponsoring this? Uh, yes, I'd like to uh, move this floor amendment number one. Second. We have a motion and a second by Councillor Jones. Are there any questions? Seeing none, a floor amendment number one to floor substitute 0-18-19. Raise your hand and say yes. 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 Those opposed? That carries unanimously. Uh, we are back on the bill. Are there any, any other questions? Councillor Gibson to close, and I will make a few closing remarks. Councillor, uh, excuse me, Councillor Gibson. Let's go to uh, Councillor Harris. Sure, thank you. Uh, one of the things that the uh, ADC wanted was to go from 50% to 30%, and I talked to other councillors about this. I don't know if I have support or not, but I'm going to go for it. Um, I think we should at least do that, and, and I am frankly skeptical that 60% is going to be new money. Maybe 60% if you include anything outside of the city limits, if you include people coming from Rio Rancho is new money, people coming from the South Valley is real money, people coming from Moriarty is real money, or new money, I mean. If, if all those are new money and people coming from Las Cruces is new money, then maybe you get to 60%. Um, but even though I think that number might be a little bit high, I still think the increment should only be based on new money, not uh, money that's, that is just circulating around the city. So what I'd like to do is, is make an amendment, and staff will tell me if this will work, because it will require that they do an amendment in the PPA. I don't think we have to actually amend the PPA if we do this, which would be on page five of the ordinance, not the red line version, but the clean version. Uh, page five, line 31, change 50 to 30. Okay, that's, that, yeah, take your time. There's a red line version, it's actually on page six of the red line, but it's on well, page it's, five of the clean one. Page five, line 31. 
Okay, so change that change 50, 50 to a 30. And that still gets them the full 1.8 million. According to Top Golf's own representative, that and I did the math, by the way, if, it, if it's a nine year payout under uh, the 50% increment, it goes up to a 15 year payout under the 30% increment. The, uh, the ordinance and the PPA still has a 20 year time frame to pay the whole thing off. And it just sits better with me that we're not actually um, taking the increment from recirculating dollars. So I'll do, uh, I'll make a floor amendment number two. And also staff, would that just, would that be enough? We don't actually have to amend the PPA because then you and Topgolf would have to go back and, and um, come up Mr. with language. Mr. President, Councilor Harris, sure. I, I do believe we would have to amend the PPA. The PPA refers to the calculation. But are we, are we passing the, increment. the PPA tonight? Or we're just, it's just no, the, a the PPA is, is uh, part and parcel of the ordinance. Oh, okay. I thought that was just a proposed or, um, uh, agreement and that if you pass this to the ordinance, then it would, it would trigger a requirement. I'm, I'm sorry, Council. Go ahead. Uh, Council, we're having a bit of a side point. Mr. Zaman, go ahead proceed. Mr. President, Councilor, Councilor Harris, and, and I'll defer to, um, to the Attorney Aguilar in a moment, but I, I, Mr. Melendra is, is suggesting that if we change the language in the ordinance and just say that the uh, PPA will be changed consistent yep. with this change, I think we'll probably be okay. Yeah, that's nice. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to make that uh, move for amendment number two um, to change uh, page five, line 31 mm -hmm. from 50 to 30 and to also require that the PPA be changed accordingly. Mr. Aguilar, did you have any comments? No. Uh, President Sanchez, no. I mean, the, the PPA, the ordinance adopts the PPA. Thank you. We have a motion. Do we have a second? We don't have a second, so that fails. Okay. We are back on the bill. Councillor Gibson. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I think I've said everything I need to say, so I just uh, urge your support on this. Thank you. And I'd like to make a few comments. I first want to thank Councillor Gibson for her work on this legislation. Uh, this is in the district that she represents. And I think she's brought up some excellent points in that the beach water park has been vacated now for over 14 years. Uh, this is, I believe, an excellent infill project for the city and for our community. And there will be $4 million or $40 million invested in our community uh, with this project. I also want to thank uh, the Bernalillo County Commissioners and their work on this project. This has been a collaborative effort between the county, the city, and the developers. It's been a long process. I know that uh, Top Golf has been working on this for over a year. They've been working with members of the city council. Uh, they've been working with the Albuquerque Economic Development Team. And it's been a real challenge. And this is a different type of project. And I believe that this council has provided the safeguards in this project. Also, one of the things that we did not talk about uh, is impact fees. Uh, there will be over $200,000 of impact fees that will be uh, received, to the, and that money will come to the city uh, with this project. And over a 10-year period, uh, right now I think we are generating about a million dollars every 10 years on that vacant piece of property uh, the property taxes will be over $10 million, and that will continue on because it's going to be a developed $40 million project. Again, the project will create uh, 300 jobs during the construction phase and approximately 200 full-time equivalent jobs when the project is operational. And I know that there's going to be 25 salaried positions that will pay between sixty dollars and $72,000 a year, and the approximate payroll will be $4.5 million a year once this facility is operational. Uh, Top Golf is expected to generate 15 million in sales annually and drop close to half a million people. I think this is going to be an excellent addition to our community. I know that we have been very cautious and very careful and I want to thank our staff, uh, Mr. Melendres, uh, Mr. Zaman for their work in working on this uh, PPA agreement. And I think we've come to a point where you know now we're going to vote on this issue. Uh, there has been one amendment and there has been a committee substitute and a tremendous, a tremendous amount of work that has been involved uh, in getting to this point. I know that we took a lot of criticism, uh, criticism today from the Albuquerque Journal and the editorial board, but I will tell the journal that the city councilors are equally as concerned about the taxpayers of our community as the administration. 
We want to make sure that our tax dollars are protected, but I truly believe that this is going to be a, an excellent investment for our city and for our community. And I'm <laughs> glad to hear Ms. Nair state that if we adopt this project tonight, that she will be working with the developers to make sure this project is completed. That's how important I feel this project is to our city. Again, Councillor Gibson, thank you for your work. And I also, being that this is uh, south of Renaissance, we've seen a lot of uh, vacancies in that area. Uh, north of Renaissance, once Costco moved and the Beachwater Park went away, the northern part of uh, Renaissance has really blossomed, but the southern part has really stagnated. And I think Councillor Borrego brought up a really good point about a destination center. Uh, these are the kind of venues that we need here in our community. And with Top Golf, I believe this is a multi-generational facility. It's not just going to attract young kids, it's gonna attract senior citizens, mid-age uh, families, but it's gonna be a real positive uh, venue for our community. And as far as the company that was looking at locating here, I wish they would have made contact with us sooner. I mean, I'm glad to see that they are still going to try to locate here in Albuquerque. And I believe Albuquerque can accommodate the competition in, in two major venues like this. It'll be a real asset to our community. But again, I want to thank our staff, the administration, and hopefully we can move forward. Uh, and this will be a real asset and gem to our community. Councilor Sanchez, may I just add one thing, please? You may. I uh, just want to be clear, we'll, we'll be happy to work with the developer if, um, if we veto and you override, then, then we'll be happy to work with the developer. Are you making that position for the speak, mayor? I cannot speak for the mayor on whether he will veto this or not, but I just wanted to be clear since my, my words have been tossed around by the developer quite a bit that uh, what I'm saying is if, you ult if we ultimately get this passed, we're happy to work together. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second. For 019 is substituted and amended. All those in favor, raise your hand and say yes. 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 Those opposed? No. That carries on an 8 to 1 vote. We are now under general public comments. There will be a two minute time limit. The light at the podium will be green for the first minute and a half. Then a bell will ring and the light will turn yellow, indicating you, you have 30 seconds remaining to wrap up your comments. At the two minute time limit, the bell will turn red, indicating your time has expired. <coughs> We'll call the first five speakers, and the first speaker is Don Schrader, I think he's left, followed by Christelle Siraz, Siraza, Lisa Ellen Urea, Rudolph Serrano, Jonathan Siegel, and Tad Naminsky. Go ahead and state your name for the record. Crystal Siarza. Welcome. Thank you, good evening, President Sanchez, Albuquerque City Councilors, City Administration, and guests in the audience. My name is Crystal Ciarza, the owner and CEO of Ciarza Social Digital, uh, and I have with me Kristen Apodaca, the Senior Community Coordinator of Club Waka Albuquerque, an adult social sports league in the city. Today, we stand before you not as small business owners, uh, but as community advocates. Uh, like many of the colored shirts uh, that were here earlier today, um, we are young professionals that incorporate a childhood game that is very much a part of our everyday livelihood, and that is called kickball. Yes, the childhood kickball used to play in the playground. So in order for us to play this game in our adult lives, we're actually dependent on the city's parks and recreation department for our fields so we can play competitive and fun kickball with our friends. We're not just young people that don't have anything better to do with our lives. We're very much small business owners, esteemed professionals, and employees of proud Albuquerque businesses, large and small. But we have a problem today. A recent decision in the city's Parks and Recreation Department will not allow for any social sport to play on certain fields with lights. Only city baseball and softball leagues will be allowed. And with this recent decision, it has created a potential closure for our Club Waka League, and for, for especially for a few seasons, and the impact will actually greatly hurt the city of Albuquerque in many ways. Hi there, thank you for having us. Um, just gonna give a few things because we're gonna run out of time very quickly. Um, Club Waka is a league that's been in New Mexico, in Albuquerque specifically, since the early 2000s. Um, we give a ton of money to the city just based on renting your fields. Um, we raise tons of charity for local uh, charity money for local charities um, and in various other ways raise lots and lots of money so um, all we're asking for is to be heard and hopefully get our fields back 
Um, and just to, to keep, put the numbers into perspective, um, we've paid the city over $10,000 each year to rent out the park. We've raised $15,000 for various charities across the city. We've had over 1,500 players each year in kickball bringing out the best young professionals that stay in Albuquerque. We've made a travel and tourism impact, hosting national tournaments to the area, booking over 75 room nights in one weekend. And we pour thousands of dollars into the bars, um, restaurants, and local ride-sharing programs with each party. Sure. But this could be lost if our fields are shut down. The Club Walker players are very much vibrant, and I know that the city had just launched the campaign called One Albuquerque. And without it, uh, without our fields, we very much cannot be one. So we ask for Parks and Recreation to actually overturn their decision to make lights and fields only available to certain sports. Uh, we as a community of kickballers are actually fighting for our fields, and we really hope that you can hear us tonight. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Thank you, Mr. President. And ladies, thank you for being patient with us. It was good to talk <laughs> in the hall during our dinner break, yeah. which was yes, not your dinner break. Yes, we're most likely going to be patrons of Top Golf too. There. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thanks for, for coming down and doing this. Um, I know we see, saw some emails today about it. Um, and as you well know, uh, I was able to speak with Ms. Nair and Mr. Padilla from the mayor's office uh, during our break. And I've connected you all by email. Um, I think we can find a quick solution. Um, and if the Parks Department is, is proposing a new rule, there's some ordinances that show how they can have, how the public can have comment and public record. We did that last year with some proposed changes to our tennis facilities and allowed the tennis community to weigh in before the rule was finalized. So I'm sure we can find a way to work through some of this. President these. Sanchez, Councilor Davis, thank you very much. We're not the only social sport that has been impacted by this. Rugby, Ultimate Frisbee, um, some of the other nonchalant soccer uh, teams that are out there, definitely not World Cup level, have been impacted by this, and we're hoping for a solution, not just for us, but for them as well. Ms. Nair. Uh, Council President Sanchez and um, members of the public, thank you for coming out. Thank you for bringing this to, um, to our attention. I think we're looking at some unintended consequences of, of probably some well-meaning um, attempts to limit other uses of the field, and so we're happy to look into this, and I've played my share of kickball. I'm not good at it, but um, I can attest that you do contribute to the local economy, so we look forward to working together. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Day. Thank Thanks you for so being much. here. Next speaker, Ellen Urea, Rudolph Serrano, Jonathan Siegel, and the last speaker will be Sue Flint under general public comment. Good evening, Mr. President and Councilors. I am sorry to report to you that since your last council hearing, another very serious accident has occurred at the corner of Candelaria and Rio Grande Boulevard where the proposed roundabout is supposed to be installed any time now. Can someone help me turn this overhead on? I'll show you a few pictures. Does it just go on? Tell me. Upside down, right side up? Good. That's an image of some damage that was done when a car plowed into a house at the corner. That's the rear of the car. Unfortunately, this is the only venue that I know where to come to make sure that something happens. We are waiting for another death any time now. In January, the mayor turned to me and said, don't worry, the roundabout's coming. We're making sure of that. And since then, we just haven't seen it. And I'm terribly concerned. I've witnessed personally a profound high-speed head-on at that very corner. And then just after the mayor spoke to me in January, I came upon another accident where someone had clipped the rear of somebody, and their car went spinning like a top and did a 360 right there on the roadway. And it's just we're courting disaster to leave it as it is. I urge you to do something about making sure that this uh, construction occurs. If the water authority, as I think I read in one newsletter from our counselor, needs help, let's help them and let's all be a good functioning government and get it done for life safety. Thank you. Stand for questions. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Benton. Thanks for sticking around and speaking, uh, Mr. Siegel. Um, so on Friday afternoon, late, right before we put our 
our bi-monthly newsletter out for the District 2. Uh, we did receive a letter from uh, the State uh, Department of Transportation uh, with their, I wouldn't say it's their final certification, maybe Ms. Mr. Rell can help me with that, but, but a major milestone uh, was, was receiving that letter actually on Friday. And as you said, uh, and as we reported in the newsletter, uh, the Water Authority wants to get in there and repair their, or update their underground before they can we construct the roundabout. But um, I, I appreciate your suggestion uh, of, of trying to fast track this, get work with the Water Authority, maybe have our bids received and ready to go by the time that they finish their work. And I'll just ask Mr. Rell if he thinks that might be possible. Mr. President, Councilor Benton, um, that's correct. Um, your, uh, your representation as a certification is really probably as accurate as it, as it is. So the DOT now has given us the green light to move forward with it. Uh, we will certainly work with the Water Authority to expedite their, uh, their portion of the program and we may be able to make the project concurrently, which is begin to move forward with our project at the same time they're doing theirs and uh, hopefully uh, try and get it done as quickly as possible. Thank you, we appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Siegel. Thank you. I hope lives can be saved. Thanks. We'll do Thank all you. we can to help you, both sides. Okay. The last speaker under general public comments is going to be Sue Flynn or Ted Naminsky. My name is Ted Naminsky. <coughs> yes. We do have problem right here with this uh, council. Cutting, well, I remember also that's 2014 when, uh, when uh, 300 people show up. They cut to 30. Then manipulating time, how much we have to speak, when we sp uh, can speak, how many times we have to speak, and we don't know when public comments, uh, what time supposed to be? Yes, Sancher, El Presidente, you going for big trouble. B violating, violating rights to speak, constitutional rights. Now, I have another big problem. Lawyers being uh, chosen by city council and tonight, they were lobbying council who, on behalf of development with who they have. Here is the changing money. And city council, that's dirty job. I'm sorry. This is dirty job. And that is now justice. Yes, do we have justice? Well, I, I had sign made, we have two justice, one for wealthy, another for poor. And uh, that bring me into district court and then sheriff deputies, in fact, they have SS, if you ask for a number, batch number, SS. Yes, add a swastika, you get answers. Mr. Minsky, thank, thank you. Sue Flint. Thank you. Um, first, I want to say that uh, all, over the years that I've been coming here, um, I was inspired by my councilman, and I'm going to say it tonight. Uh, I went back to school. I started after I was 60, so I've grown old with some of you as I've been in these chambers over the past 10 years. But I graduated with my associate degree in pre-law and I'm extremely proud of myself that I did with a 4.0 and most of my work and my papers were written about what goes on in these chambers and within the city government. Um, and I was going to wait until August to do it when you come back but I'm going to let you know my councilman is going to be stepping down and I will be running for his seat in District 4. I am unconventional and you know but I'm I have my personal side and I have my business side and I know how to split the two of them. And when I get up here, I actually feel extremely bad when I start tearing into people and try to seek them out to apologize. 
But um, I am very strong on what I advocate for, and one of the things that I advocate for is for the people. I don't understand some of the politics that uh, pertain to the money that's allotted to the developers. And now I'm going to jump really quick to the IDEO and the ABC-Z. Um, I, I've been doing some research, and quite honestly, I'm not seeing a lot of protection for the people. You're having these developers that are going into these areas, and, and because it's permissible now, they're just throwing things up, and then the uh, consequences are on the neighborhoods, like my neighborhood. And it is really hard to fight what's going on when we don't have the city helping us to make sure that we're protected by, in my instance, uh, commercial trucks, things that keep my neighborhood uh, from, from enjoying the quality of life. But um, I understand, and I just want to say that you'll be seeing and hearing about me until I either win or I lose, but um, I look forward to learning even more. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes general public comments. We are now under item 11. That is announcements. Councilor Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. There will be an Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority meeting on Wednesday, June 20th at 5 p.m. in the Vincent E. Griegos Chambers. Councilor Pena. Thank you, Mr. President. The Albuquerque Bernalillo County Government Commission meeting is Scheduled for, um, scheduled for June 28th is canceled. Thank you. Councilor Benton. Thank you, Mr. President. There will be a Rail Yards Advisory Board meeting on Thursday, July 12th at 1130 in the Council Committee Room. And also, uh, Mr. President, if I could, just reminder to everyone, uh, Shakespeare on the Plaza is still going on this Thursday through Sunday, July 1st, uh, alternating between As You Like It and The Merry Wives of Windsor. It's a lot of fun. Good family fr friendly uh, fun down on the plaza starting at 7.40 p.m. Uh, Thursdays through Sundays. Councilor Winter. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to make an announcement. We had the one year before the National Senior Games, um, <laughs> oh, I don't know what you call it, a party, and we had the mayor was playing pickleball out there, but it was just to get everybody excited about the National Senior Games. They're going to be here next year. And so it was a great success. Um, I know that the New Mexico Senior Games has already got a huge amount of folks that are going to participate, and that's in July. And so we're just, everybody's getting ready for those games. Um, sure. There's going to be at least 10,000 senior athletes like myself out there and their spouses, and they'll spend a lot of money. Thank you. Councilor Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. And Councilor Winter, will you be participating in those New Mexico Senior Games? Yes, I will. Well, I will be participating if I don't get hurt before then. <laughs> Good luck. And we hope you bring home a national championship. <laughs> Councillor Davis. Well, to follow that, two announcements. One, uh, Councillor Winter is being humble because he is the National Senior Game Athlete of the Month, uh, recognized for his work on his <clears throat> pole vaulting. Um, but not to be outdone, there will also be a Mesa del Sol Tax Increment <laughs> Development District meeting <clears throat> on Monday the 30th at 1 p.m. in the Council Committee Room on the ninth floor. And we were going to welcome our new member, Mr. Sunerle Stewart, but he already went home for the day, so we hope he shows up. <laughs> Councilor Gibson. And then after that, you can go to a Winrock Tax Increment Development District Board meeting also on Monday, July 30th at 1.45 in the Council Committee Room on the ninth floor. Thank you, and there will be a Montecito Estates Public Improvement District Board meeting on Tuesday, July 24th at 2 p.m. in the DMD Conference Room, 7th floor, room 7096. There will also be a Boulders Public Improvement District Board meeting on Wednesday, July 25th at 2 p.m. in the Council Committee Room on the ninth floor. There will be a Volterra Public Improvement District Board meeting on Wednesday, July 25th, 25th at 3 p.m. in the Council Committee Room on the ninth floor. There will be a Wantabo Hills Public Improvement District Board meeting on Thursday, July 26th at 2 p.m. in the Council Committee Room on the ninth floor. There will be a Lower Petroglyph Public Improvement District Board meeting on Thursday, July 26th at 3 p.m. in the Council Committee Room on the ninth floor. There will be a Trials Public Improvement District Board meeting on Monday, July 30th at 11 a.m. in the Council Committee Room on the ninth floor. There will be a Mesa del Sol Public Improvement District Board meeting on Monday, July 30th at 2.30 p.m. in the Council Committee Room on the ninth floor. And there will also be a Saltillo Public Improvement District Board meeting on Monday, July 30th 
at 3.15 p.m. in the council committee room on the ninth floor. So if you want to attend a meeting, you've got a lot of them you can't attend. Satyu. <laughs> okay, let's go to item 12, public hearings. Uh, that is item B, AC 18-9. Uh, Ralph Delbero appeals the decision of the Zoning Board of Appeals. This matter has been withdrawn by the applicant. I make a motion to accept the withdrawal. Second. We have a motion and a second by Councillor Gibson for withdrawal of this item. All those in favor, signify by saying yes. Yes. Yes, yes those opposed say no. That carries unanimously. Uh, we are now under the second appeal, and that's item A, AC 18-6. Dalen Hochman of Roy Ball, Mack, and Cordova, PC. Agents for Larry Tucker appeals the decision of the Environmental Planning Commission, and I will call on Mr. Melendres to explain. Yeah, Mr. President, I'd like to recuse myself from this hearing. Councillor uh, Winner has been recused uh, on AC 18-6. Mr. Melendres, go ahead and proceed. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor Winner. Thank you, Mr. President. Council will be having a full hearing on this matter. On, uh, on its meeting on May 21st, the City Council voted to reject the LUHO recommendation in this matter and hold the full hearing this evening. The issue in this appeal is whether an existing bed and breakfast um, that's conditionally permitted within the Huning Highlands Sector Development Plan should be also specifically authorized through zoning to host special events at that location. The Environmental Planning Commission approved a zone map amendment um, to effectively allow that to happen by changing the zoning at that location to SU1 for bed and breakfast and to include special events. However, a neighbor across the alley, uh, Mr. Larry Tucker, who is the appellant tonight, appealed that decision of the Environmental Planning Commission. Um, the land use hearing officer reviewed that matter and recommended that the Environmental Planning Commission be reversed and that the zone map amendment be uh, denied based on findings that the zoning wasn't adequately justified in comparison to the existing zoning. In other words, they both seem to satisfy um, the policies that were being used to justify the zone map amendment. Luho also took some issue with whether or not uh, SU1 zoning could be granted in this way when there are specific conditions for SU1 bed and breakfast that did not appear to be met here. Um, and finally, there were no specific conditions on the bed and breakfast uh, with respect to its events. Um, how many it could have per year, for example, or any other parameters relative to those. Um, with that, you'll hear from the parties tonight. They'll be making arguments based on the record um, to the extent that we identify any new evidence that might be proposed tonight. We can examine that to figure out whether or not it's something the council wants to accept. Okay, all presenters other than attorneys must be sworn in. The parties are allowed to cross-examine one another. All those who will testify, please stand at this time and raise your right hand. If you're not an attorney and plan to testify, do you swear to tell the truth? I do. Thank you. Okay, let's go over the uh, rules. There will be time limits for presenters, and they are as follows. A, eight minutes presentation from applicant, from appellant, Dayan Hochman, the attorney on behalf of Larry Tucker. B, 10 minutes, a presentation from appellee, Steve and Kara Grant. There will be a three minute presentation by our, our response question by the city planning staff. Uh, there will be a two minute rebuttal by appellant, if any, and there will be, be deliberation and discussion among the counselors. And let's go ahead and proceed with the presentation from the appellant. Welcome. President Sanchez, members of the council, thank you so much for having me here tonight. I appreciate it. My name is Dayan Hockman V. Hill. I am advocating on behalf of my client, Larry Tucker. Unfortunately, Mr. Tucker can't be here this evening. He had a business engagement out of the country, but he wants you to know that he's here in spirit. Um, I did have a presentation on poster board for you, but as Mr. Melindres gra graciously informed me, that is actually against council rules. So I will be foregoing that presentation, um, and I will be relying entirely on my oratory skills. So here we go. Um, 16 feet, six inches. That is the distance between Larry Tucker and the uh, outdoor events that Steve and Cara Grant have been having. Uh, outdoor events that are at sometimes large parties, including weddings that have amplified sound, DJs, music, uh, adults reasonably and, uh, imbibing alcoholic beverages at times, and they sometimes can go well into the night. They have affected Mr. Tucker, uh, his ability to sleep, some nights. He is certainly inhibited from having his own outdoor events at the time that these parties are going on. And what's uh, most unfortunate is that he actually leaves his home uh, most of the times that these events are being held. 
So uh, with that in mind, 16 feet, six inches is a little more than, than actually I think it's less than what separates uh, the council from myself right now. So I ask you to keep that in consideration. Um, I also wanna bring your attention to section 1E of enactment 27-1980 of the city of Albuquerque zone change policy. That states, a change of zone shall not be approved where some of the permissive uses in the zone would be harmful to adjacent property, the neighborhood, or the community. Um, I wanna keep, I wanna take a, a moment there to emphasize how important that is, but I will be coming back to that later. Going to uh, reasons for affirming the Luho opinion, uh, granting our appeal. One, the EPC failed to show sufficient justification as to why a zone change would be more advantageous based on the land use policies for the area. It's very important to keep uh, into consideration here that the grant BNB was already allowed under the conditional use permit that they had. The sole reason cited for the uh, conversion from an SU2-MR zoning to an SU-1-SU2 was to allow for special events. That's it, just for special events. Second thing I'd like to bring to your attention. If rezoned, the grants properties do not meet, meet the specific requirements for BNBs situated in SU-1 zones. Mr. Belinders already touched on this. Um, Properties abutting local streets are only allowed in S, uh, B and B properties abutting local streets are only allowed in SU-1 zones if the site is at least one acre in size. The grants do not have that. That is not something that can be changed. Secondly, the number of rooms in the B and B exceeds the number of rooms allowed for B and Bs in SU-1 zones. Also, something that cannot be changed. Uh, I also want to take your. I want to bring your attention. Um, to the fact that the grants have only obtained a conditional permit for one out of their three properties. I know that the grants have testified before that they have two conditional use permits. I've employed a law clerk many, many hours trying to find that second permit. I do not believe it exists. We just haven't been able to see it. Um, and also I think more importantly and more disturbingly, um, the grants did not seek a zone change application in this case until after they were um, cited by code enforcement. And I beg the council to take into consideration the precedent that you would be setting here if you allowed for this appeal to be overturned. I think it also begs the question as to whether or not they would have sought an application had they not been caught. Um, going back to enactment, enactment 270-1980, um, again, based on this language, it doesn't state that economic development or something that benefits the community should trump uh, harm inflicted on an adjacent neighbor, nor is the standard that uh, economic development or something that benefits the community should be balanced against the amount of harm that is um, persistent to an adjacent neighbor. The standard is very clear. It states that harm to an adjacent neighbor, the neighborhood, or the community from a permissive use prevents the zone change, period. I think that my client throughout this record has demonstrated harm in many instances. Um, and I also want to bring to your attention that none of the letters of support that have been submitted in the record on behalf of the grants, um, except for one, are of an adjacent neighbor or someone with a contiguous property, and that one neighbor who submitted a letter is not there full time, and I think that's important to note. So, um, in conclusion, I, the zone change here, and I, I really agree, um, and I think the law is on our side, as pointed out by the LUHO, it's, it's just not justified. Um, and there's no credible argument that the Lou Ho's opinion was unfounded in this case, unless you want to completely relitigate re the matter. And um, I, I don't see a reason to do that right now. The record that stands in front of you has been um, found to be incomplete. I think that if you want to kick the can down the road back to the EPC to give them another bite at the apple, and I'm out of bad metaphors, um, I, I think that would be wholly unfair to my client. Why even have an appeal process to begin with if you're just going to give the EPC a chance after chance to substantiate a record that's already be, been found by the Luhof to be unsubstantiated? I know that this is a, a difficult decision to make. I know that this is an unusual situation to be in and that the Luho um, usually doesn't grant an appeal in this manner, but it is the right decision. Um, I, I want to stress that to you. Um, the grants, uh, I, want, I want to let you know, they are actually, they are wonderful people. I've had several interactions with them. Um, we've been working on this for, for several months, and I don't think that they've done 
this out of malevolence or out of disregard. I, I think that um, they've just made some mistakes, or at the very least, they may be negligence. But that doesn't change the state of the law. That doesn't change the consequences of not granting this appeal, and, and that you would be encouraging similarly similarly situated people to um, violate zoning codes and reward them for it. I, I just don't think that's something the city council would want to do here. Um, and but. But lastly, and most importantly, I, I save this for the end, um, I think it's important for the council to know that all is not lost for the grants, actually, in this situation under the new um, IDO, EDO standards, the comprehensive zoning. They actually, if you did, if you affirmed the appeal this evening, they actually would still be allowed to have parties. They would just be limited to six. And we've actually been trying to come to uh, an agreement or, or mediate some sort of settlement where six parties would be the number that uh, the grants would be limited to. We think that that would be the best outcome here and that the grants would be allowed to, to pursue um, this development of their property, but it would also give my client um, a tangible number that he could stick to to give him notice of the party so he could get out of town before that happened. And, um, I think it would allow all, both parties to get on with their lives. So thank you very much for hearing me, and I would ask that you um, uphold the appeal. Thank you, Ms. Hoffman. Uh, next will be the uh, presentation from the appellee, Stephen Kira Grant. Good evening, Mr. President and fellow city councilors. My name is Steve Grant. My wife is not here this morning or today because of being in Colorado with family. Thank you very much for the opportunity for, the, uh, for, us to, for me to be here and talk to you about the zone amendment to our bed and breakfast. That's currently zoned as a SU2 MR um, zoning. We're now requesting a rezone to an SU2 SU1 for bed and breakfast to include special events. We've been operating the properties for 12 years. As stated in some of the previous documentation, we were granted a conditional use permit for the 207 High Street property in 2006, the 209 High Street in 2008. However, during a zone map amendment, it was brought to our attention that there was no conditional use permit for the 209 High Street property, which is something we were very surprised because we went through the same uh, procedure and process in 2008, and we've been paying business licenses for both properties directed by the city. The 201 high, high Street House, which is located here, is our personal residence and has a private cottage that we use at times for the bed and breakfast as well. This is why we'd also like to include 201 High Street in the zone map amendment. Combining all three lots will allow all three properties to be zoned correctly as a bed and breakfast operation. Shortly after opening our bed and breakfast, we were asked by a guest if we would ever consider hosting weddings on the property. We agreed to allow this particular guest to host their wedding after booking the rooms. Due to the fact that the homes are historic in nature, as you can tell and see, and unique to the historic neighborhood, the properties drew interest from other couples, and weddings began. Not many, but a few. Weddings were rented and hosted only by the property if they rented the rooms, if they were allowed on the grounds. Because of the rooms being occupied by the couples and their guests, we were under the assumption that hosting a private wedding was not out of compliance with city zoning. We were always on the properties when these small events occurred, up to 50. Because of us overseeing the events and being on site, everything shut down by 10 p.m. The events were also limited to no more than 50, as I mentioned a moment ago. During the last year, eight years, we've allowed a limited number of guests to host these certain events. We've always stayed consistent with our communication, and we've always made sure that our immediate neighbors were happy, and they have been. However, we did have one complaint. 
from a new neighbor in 2014 that moved in 2014, Mr. Larry Tucker, the appellant, which complained and evidently went to the city to complain, and that's when the violation occurred, July, July 10th, 2017, based on R270-1980. That states that a use of bed and breakfast does not include the use of special events. We started the process immediately and were advised that a zone change from SU2MR to a SU2SU1 bed and breakfast to include special events was appropriate. We used all the guidelines as well as a comprehensive plan to make a sound case as to why a zone change was advantageous for the properties as well as our B&B. We've included numerous letters of support from all the surrounding neighbors, the east side, west side, north, south, we have letters of support from Edo, from the Hewning Highland Neighborhood Association. Our neighbors, as well as the associations, have appreciated the investment and the improvements we've made. They voiced to us that our business has not only improved the quality of the downtown area, but has made others in our city love it and enjoy the downtown beauty and uniqueness of the historic area. When our case went to EPC, they approved us because the zone map to an SU2, SU. SU1 for a bed and breakfast to include special events would more clearly define how the use of the three lots would be comprised and are used as a bed and breakfast. The, SU, the uh, RU270 1980 zoning code on a bed and breakfast does have some limitations. It does not exactly directly ex address the use of bed and breakfast for special events. Also, the Huny Hyler sec sector plan, the definition of a bed and breakfast um, has the same issue. It doesn't really explain how events can be used for a B&B. &B. Therefore, the EPC's decision for a zone amendment would more clearly define how these properties would be used. The appellant, as well as the Luho, did question that allowing special events would be advantageous to the community. The EPC found that it was very advantageous to the community and neighborhood. The Huning Highland Neighborhood Association was very, is very unique and is very historic in the middle of close to downtown. We continue to invest and fight for this neighborhood for all these grand homes that are almost 100 years old and then some. Having a bed and breakfast and allowing small gatherings has encouraged many of our city to see this area for what it is and what it was, a beautiful urban downtown neighborhood which people live and enjoy and have local businesses as well. As well. This is not your traditional neighborhood. People are here because they love the action, they love the activity, and that's what downtown brings. We have, been, we have many patrons throughout this great city. Once they come and experience, they come back to us again and again. Another issue mentioned that the EPC needed to look at is regard to the number of rooms that we operate. Let me explain. The 207 High Street property has four guest rooms. The 209 High Street property has four guest rooms. In addition, we have two sm small private cottages. One is part of the 209 property, a guest house in the back, and the other is a cottage that's in back of the 201 High Street property, which is next to the Heritage House. The cottages are frequently used as an Airbnb. We've heard of that before, haven't we? <laughs> Home away, long-term rentals, but also can be used as bed and breakfast. Therefore, we have a total of 10 rooms. Hope that explains a little bit there. We want to absolutely comply with all city regulation and have tried hard to make it happen since we've been in operation for over 12 years. We run an ethical and upstanding business that I believe is a benefit to the city and others. The final thing I would like to address today is the kind of zone we are requesting. It would be called a spot zone because of other properties around us being a SU2MR. This zone change in the zoning of the three lots that we own so we can better operate in a more clear and, underst clear and understanding of what we're allowed to use the properties for. Since the zone change for a bed and breakfast is to include special events, we will clearly state that it's be limited to what the property would be used for, period. We will only be using as a bed and breakfast and occasionally a special event. Our request is not unique one especially with other properties in downtown. One quick example of this is a historic Wells Park neighborhood where a new B&B &B called the Painted Lady Bed and Brew was approved as an SU-1. This is surrounded by residential homes. 
but the city did see the advantage of this business from a historic preservation and economic development perspective. Our zone amendment will bring the same benefits to the city and the community as well. I sure hope that some of what I've shared with you will shed light on why you're requesting this amendment. As previously stated, we, have desire, we desire nothing more than to be a good neighbor to all our neighbors. And we've attempted this several times with Mr. Tucker, the appellant. We even, we even proposed a facilitated prior meeting prior to the EPC hearing to make sure we could figure some things out between he and us. Of course, <clears throat> excuse me, we of course would be much more concerned if others in our neighborhood had the same concern or, or concern as well, but this is not the case. He's the only one, the, ever, the only ever complaint we've had. As stated earlier, we have nothing but strong neighborhood support. It's our desire to, be, to continue operating our very successful bed and breakfast operation. Don't take our word for it. We have over 1,000 five-star reviews from various review sites. They tell the story. It brings great exposure to our community and to our city. We have a unique venue for someone to stay at and for what, someone to maybe have a reception at. Thank you, city councilors. And I stand here, as I stand here this evening, I hopefully have made it clear and kind of helped you understand more about what we've done and what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grant. Uh, next, we will go to our staff. Good evening, President Sanchez, members of the council. My name is Catalina Lehner, and I'm a senior staff planner with the city's planning department. First, I'd like to remind everyone that the zone change request is being considered using the regulations in effect at the time of application submittal, which was December 14th of 2017, under the zoning code, which was in effect at that time. This was prior to enactment of the Integrated Development Ordinance, or IDO. At its February 8, 2018 hearing, the EPC voted to approve a zone change from SU2MR to SU2SU1 for bed and breakfast to include outdoor events and the associated site development plan for building permit of the as-built site. The EPC found that the proposed zoning is consistent with the health, safety, and welfare of the city because the request clearly facilitates realization of applicable goals and policies in the Comprehensive Plan and the Huning Highlands Sector Development Plan. The subject site is located one block north of Central Avenue, which is designated a major transit corridor and a Main Street corridor, which are intended to support mixed use and more urban types of uses. The request clearly facilitates realization of policies regarding land uses, local business, and historic assets. Specifically, the request furthers the goal of the Huning Highlands Sector Development Plan regarding continued development of the area into a viable residential and commercial area, building on its unique historic character and location. So regarding the zone change request, it's important to understand that the proposed use is analyzed. The proposed use consists of the existing lodging use on three lots and the special events. Now, the special use zone at 1416222B35 of the zoning code contains a category for use combinations not allowed in other zones relative to a specific site, and that is exactly what this is. The references to the site being required to comply with bed and breakfast as defined in the SU1 zone are incorrect because there is another category because the special events takes it into the category B35 in the zoning code where use combinations not allowed in other zones relative to this site lives. So there is a location for that use. With respect to what Ms. Hockman B. Hills cited in R270-1980, I'd like to read that test for you under section E, where it states, a change of zone shall not be approved where some of the permissive uses in the zone would be harmful to adjacent property, the neighborhood, or the community. The way that zone changes are analyzed is that there is consideration given to, again, adjacent property, the neighborhood, or the community. This is an or. Adjacent property involves more than one property owner. It, 
It has to do with the neighborhood. Specifically, there are um, other property owners that have indeed shown support for the request. And I'd like to make that clear that zone changes are not decided based upon one property owner. Rather, it's adjacent property, plural, the neighborhood, or the community. And that's the way the test has been administered. Thank, Thank you. you. Your time has expired. Are there any questions for staff? Thank you. Uh, we now have a two minutes for rebuttal by the appellant, if any. Go ahead and proceed. You, Thank you, President Sanchez. Um, I will be brief. So, um, with regards to the change of the SU-1 zoning, and there still are acreage limitations. The grants uh, do not meet that. Uh, our count with their website at this moment is 11 rooms. I don't think whether or not it's an Airbnb or a bed and breakfast matters. It's the matter is the count. The restriction and limitation is to eight rooms. Um, I, I have, we have no doubt that the grants have every intention to run a great business, and I'm sure they are, but again, that's not the standard. The standard here is that there are zoning restrictions and requirements, and they have to meet that standard. The LUHO uh, has found, and we tend to agree, that that standard has not been, been met. If you review the record, it is full with a lot of ad hominem arguments. It's beneficial because it is. They have not really stated any benefit in terms of the land use restrictions for that area. All they've basically come to the conclusion of is that, oh, it's parties, parties bring economic development, it's a fun area, we want parties in that area, it's close to downtown, therefore we should do it. Again, that's not the standard. While I respect uh, Ms. Lehner's opinion and that she deals with matters of this type much more than I do, um, I would respectfully dissent to her, uh, her application of the rule. The rule says that uh, if it's harmful to adjacent property, does not say properties, so I'm a little puzzled by that specific application of that test. Um, and I think that's all I have to say to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Hopeman. Uh, we are now going to open the uh, deliberations and discussions among the council members. Councilor Harris. Uh, just kind of curious, Mr. Melendrez, in terms of the city planning staff, uh, I think they were, appear to be um, supporting the EPC today, but it, Sometimes I think sometimes they support the LUHO. I mean, is it do they support the does the planning department always support the EPC and not our LUHO? Um, Mr. President, I think my my sort of experience with that is that the planning staff usually supports their recommendation, and so if they've given a recommendation to the EPC um, and that's been followed, then they would naturally sort of you know flow with their testimony before council. And in this particular instance, planning staff did support. Um, approval of this and made that recommendation to the EPC, so that's all consistent. Oh, I see. And maybe we don't want to get into this, it would open up a box of Pandora's, but what is the current zoning on that? I mean, would it be different if the application were, were brought today? Um, Mr. President and Councillor Harris, um, I have not unfortunately committed all of the ID, IDO zone you know, nomenclature to memory. However, um, I, I am familiar with the status of it under its new zone, and, and it would be a permitted use. And as was relayed, um, I believe, by Ms. Hockman V. Hill, uh, it would be permitted use allowing up to six uh, special events per year in association with the BNB under the new IDO zoning. So it would be a permitted use with six special events. Mr. President, um, Councilor Harris, correct. So if they just dismissed, they could just do six events now. Mr. President, Councilor Harris, correct. I want to, I want to drop one sort of caveat sure. there in that um, the zoning enforcement officer is the official charged with making the official determination about zoning rights on the property. Um, I've made an assessment. I think the planning department has made an assessment and the parties have made an assessment, but we haven't gotten that official sort of reasoned, talked out analysis from the zoning enforcement officer. So that's the sort of caveat on that analysis. And is there a definition of special event? Because one thing that occurred to me and a couple of the other counselors was that if you have a bed and breakfast and you invite four people over and you open up a bottle of champagne um, and then someone puts on a wedding dress, is that a special event? <laughs> uh, Mr. President, uh, Councilor Harris, that's a, that's a great question. And um, it's something that that, that uh, looked at a little bit with respect to the way special events are handled under the IDO. Um, and it's not completely clear what would trigger that or not. Um, again, 
you know, I think as we move forward, that would be uh, something that the zoning enforcement officer would have to use judgment on relative to those things. Of course, um, there's getting a question about what the rights are, and then there's enforcing against activities relative to those rights. So um, for the city, it's a little bit challenging to enforce after hours and on the weekends for our zoning enforcement staff when weddings and the like would usually be taking place. Um, but there would have to be a judgment call made about what constitutes a special event or not in this context. Let me give you a uh, more concrete example. Uh, recently, my wife's goddaughter, we had her graduation, high school graduate at my house. There's probably 20, 30 people there. Um, probably earlier in the year, uh, there was a baby shower. Probably 20, 30 people there. Um, we tend to have our house for Thanksgiving. There's probably 30, there might have been 50 people there. I mean, and I don't have a permit for any of these things. So, you know, there seems to be some ambiguity as to what's a special event and what's not. And so, uh, I don't know, that, that's just a question in my mind. How do we sort this out? Let's go to Councilor Jones and Councilor Benton. I think I have an answer to that. I believe in this case we're talking about a special event that somebody's paying to have there versus your family, as rowdy as they might be. <laughs> I, think, I think we're talking about a totally different, separate thing here. And if I may take my turn at this, you I. May. Um, this is very interesting. This is a very interesting case because I can, I understand some of the issues here. But in reality, um, I agree uh, that this is a wonderful place for bed and breakfast. And it looks like they're beautiful and they're doing a great job and they are definitely enhancing the community and the neighborhood. But I do have an issue with that many events. If they were my neighbor, I would probably get my champagne and a shotgun and go explain to them that we're not gonna have a party as many nights as we do. So uh, I am not that, and it is not me, but I think we're talking about a different thing here. This is a commercial enterprise. We're talking a commercial enterprise. Um, and because of that, I'm gonna go ahead and say this. I believe that the Luho made the right decision, and I would like to make a, dis uh, make a motion to uphold the Luho's finding, Luho's decision and the findings. I think he's a very, he was very thoughtful. He gave some good reasoning. Um, and it is not zoned or could be zoned for a party place. So, but bed and breakfast, magnificent. And it's beautiful and it should be doing well. So I would like to make the motion that we uphold the Lujo's decision and his findings. Second. We have a motion and a second by Councilor Gibson. Councilor Benton. Um, I didn't see this in the record, but maybe you did, uh, Mr. Melendez. Um, were there, uh, these were zoning complaints and, and not uh, noise complaints, correct? Is that correct? Mr. President, um, Councilor Benton, the, the way that the matter precipitated was through a complaint to zoning for the use. Um, there's some discussion in the record before the EPC about noise, um, but it did precipitate through a zoning complaint. And I. I think I read in the record that that uh, that they do still, or at least seek to comply with with the hours in the in the noise ordinance. Mr. President, Councilor Benton, that is uh, in the testimony before the EPC, and I think corroborated by Mr. Grant today. Okay. Um, I agree. It's a <clears throat> complicated and, and difficult case, and and when we see such overwhelming support from other neighbors, it gives one pause. Um, as was argued that, that, uh, that there's a seemingly strong support from, from other neighbors. And I, I, uh, I normally try to take that with a grain of salt when that's argued, but, but um, it is an indication of sorts of, of to whether it's harmful to the neighborhood or not. Um, so, difficult situation, I mean, and and the number of of anomalies, you know, the 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 acreage, the uh, um, the fact that they could still have a number of events, uh, but maybe not as many as as they would otherwise. So, under the IDO, so, difficult uh, decision. Councilor Gibson. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, 
And one thing, I, I don't know, maybe it was already mentioned and it got by me. Um, I, I think it's great that uh, both parties are willing to talk about this and maybe come up with a, uh, an agreement uh, be, between themselves, uh, between each other rather. Um, it's, it looks like a really nice place. Um, I'd love to see it. I'd love to stay there some night. Uh, it probably never happened, but uh, I certainly want to encourage the encourage the, the proprietors and uh, uh, you know help them. But uh, I am going to be also supporting this uh, decision to accept the Luho findings and um, and to grant this appeal. That's it. Thanks, Councilor Bodego. I'm going to support Councillor uh, Jones's um, uh, recommendation to uphold Luho. I think that, and I <laughs> believe it or not, I worked in this area um, on this sector plan, and I, I, um, I know that you know intention. The intention back then probably was to allow the, the bed and breakfast, and as time went on, it seemed from the record that you know other uses were occurring you know like the the special events and um you think about the entire area and it and i think the lady who spoke mentioned that you know property over properties if you look at the area it's predominantly residential and um you know I would pers personally not like having parties, loud parties, or you know, big parties in my neighborhood on a co on a constant basis. And I think that because it, it is predominantly a residential area, um, this er this particular use of having allowing the bed and breakfast and allowing the special events creates a, a different type of use. And I think that, um, you know, being respectful of the community and looking at the legal standards um, that our staff gave us um, to make this dis decision on, um, you know, there was an error in applying applicable ordinances. There was an error in the action or decision. Um, the decision was made arbitrarily and, or capriciously. Um, or was a manifest abuse of discretion. And that one stands out to me a little bit. Um, the council may decide on an appeal based on whether there is a preponderance of evidence supporting the outcome, et cetera. So I think from that perspective, um, you know, I think that it actually changes the use if we continue to allow, um, you know, a, a large number of special events. And for that reason, I, I mean, I think we're already allowing the bed and breakfast and the error B and B. And, you know, we're still allowing some special events within the zoning. Is that correct, Mr. Melendres? Um, Mr. President, Councilor Borrego, uh, per the IDO, yes. Thank you. So I will be supporting Councilor Jones. Councilor Benton? Can I, may I ask a question of Ms. Lehner? Mr. President, absolutely. Uh, Ms. Lehner, while you're walking up, I'll start. Um, what about the uh, acreage question that was raised? Was that, um, I may have not noticed it, whether you commented on that in your staff report and, and what's your position on that uh, acreage requirement? Mr. President, Councillor Benton, my understanding, if I recollect correctly, is that the acreage requirement is found for B&Bs is found in the SU1 zone under, I think it's B8, which is B&B is this thing. However, I believe that that does not apply because there is another use category. We keep talking about, I hear that saying the use. The use is bed and breakfast and special events. That is a use combination not found elsewhere mm -hmm. in B of R270-1980. Therefore, it kicks it over to B35 instead of B8. So therefore, I believe that acreage requirement does not apply. 
And that, that acreage requirement has to do with the type of the category of street that it can be located on? Is that? Mr. President, Councillor Benton, I believe that's correct. Okay. Um, and then is it, a same, is it the same situation with the number of rooms? Or was that not? Part of Mr. The President, hearing. Councillor Benton, I believe that is the same situation because the special events making it in kicking it into another category. Right. So, so when we say SU SU one for B and B, with the events now we're creating a, a, a different animal. Yes, Mr. President, Councillor Benton. Thank you, Council Vice President Terrace. Thank you. And, and one question, and maybe that's just because I'm curious, it probably doesn't matter if this, if the appeal gets upheld, it looks like that this area under the IDO is upzoned a little bit based on what I'm hearing. Would you agree with that? Mr. President, Councillor Harris, that's a bit difficult to assess not knowing exactly what all the other zones are currently and what they are at present. So I cannot generally agree or disagree. Okay. However, it would um, convert to R1B under the IDO. Okay. And is there some sort of conditional use or something that they could get or permits or something? Could they, or, or, or is it be six? Would that be it? I mean, could they get licenses or permits for more events or would that be it under the current zoning law? Do you know? Zoning code, do you know? President Sanchez, Council Member Harris, there are three lots in the grant's property. One has a current conditional use, the other two do not. If they were to seek a conditional use for the two remaining properties and the bed and breakfast definition in the IDO has a stipulation regarding the number of rooms. It's under eight. So if there are eight rooms, less than eight rooms on all of these lots, then they would also be allowed to have a certain number of special events. And I believe that is six according to the definition of bed and breakfast in the IDO. So they might be able to stack them to 18? <laughs> Mr. President, Councillor Harris, as Mr. Melinders has advised, these are questions for the zoning enforcement officer, and so okay. I don't feel like I'm confident. All right, I'm, I'm just curious how that. this is going to shake out in the future. Although I, I agree with you, this is not really part of the appeal. I'm just, as I'm learning about the new zoning code, you're up here, so I felt like asking a question. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank Mr. you. President. I'd like to make a couple of comments. Uh, first and foremost, initially I was opposed to what Mr. Grant was trying to do here. Uh, he does have the neighborhood support. He was in violation of the zoning code. So he came back and made the request for a zone change, and that is what is currently being appealed at this time. You know, we've got one neighbor, and that is uh, Mr. Tucker, uh, that opposes what is being done here. I think this is a unique situation in a unique area, and he said that the music stops after 10 o'clock at night. I don't think there's weddings going on seven days a week during the weekdays, probably on weekends. But I think he's brought a really good project and a very valid point in what he's trying to do here. Initially, I was against what he was trying to do here because he was in violation of the zoning code. But after hearing his, uh, his comments tonight, I think he's got a very valid uh, point here where you know, he's trying to provide an adequate type of uh, operation with a bed and breakfast, and it's only allowed if people are staying in his facility. Again, it's unique, it's new. And I would personally like to see this remanded back to the EPC to see if some more work can be done on this. And hopefully he can work uh, with Mr. Tucker in uh, getting this resolved and, and worked out. Mr. President. Councilor Bett. Uh, another question for, for Mr. Melendres. Um, part of the problem that, that I'm wrestling it, it with is the fact that special events are not defined. And you know, if we were talking about some sort of uh, agreement between neighbors that there would not be amplified music or something along those lines, um, I feel a lot more comfortable about this situation. Um, do we have the latitude to stipulate something of that sort? Mr. President, Councilor Benton, um, just to update you on one thing, looking really quickly at the, at the IDO, there's some discussion about what constitutes a special event, and um, it's an event that can be up to the seating capacity of the uh, unit. And so that's not completely helpful to your question, um, but I, I will say that to the extent that the council was interested in seeing limitations on the proposed use, um, and if there's an interest 
uh, to remand it back to the EPC, that may be the appropriate place for that dialogue. Uh, they can have a little bit more of an exchange on what's appropriate without evidence limitations that you would have here and hearing from the public on those. Um, for example, the EPC could, could um, include in their use under the SU zone, uh, SU1 for bed and breakfast and special events limited to no more than six per year at a maximum of 50 people per event or something like that. And so um, there, the, I guess the larger point, the LUHA identified a few issues, including some issues the way that uh, EPC anal analyzed the zone change, how it made its findings relative to this concept of is it the B7 bed and breakfast use or is it the B35 special special use? And that wasn't clear from the findings of the EPC. It wasn't clear what they were dealing with. Um, and so to the extent you have those interests um, and, and you have an interest in remanding, that would probably be a con uh, appropriate thing to do is to send it back to the EPC to put those limitations. So there's no shortcut for us other than sending it back to the EPC, which I, I'm reluctant. Um, Mr. President, Councilor Benton, um, okay, if you wanted to, to try to sort of short cut it as you're suggesting, um, to put the limitations in here based on what the council felt was appropriate under the zoning, um, we still haven't dealt with the issue of the proposed zoning being more advantageous as articulated by the policies of the comprehensive plan, which is sort of the threshold issue to the approval of the zoning. And I think the EAP, the LUHO, you know, in my estimation, did a good job of, of identifying that no benefits were um, identified juxtaposed to the existing zoning, that they both appear to advance those those policies. So the limitations is only one it is only one piece of the pie that you know we might be able to solve. We'd have to also come up um, with a justification under those policies as well. Uh, Mr. President, I'm just concerned that that uh, in a way, no matter which way this goes, if we haven't straightened out, if we collectively as the city, including the planning commission haven't straightened out what this means in terms of what a special event is. And, and in Councilor Harris's example, if it's just several guests and a bottle of champagne and a wedding dress, then is that, is that a special event? And I, you know, I live in a neighborhood where, where there's a, a larger B&B where there are a lot of these events and they are amplified and yeah, it, it's, it, it can be loud, but they don't violate the noise ordinance. And, um, and that's that. But uh, so we know, we know what a big event, a big loud event <laughs> uh, looks and sounds like, but we don't know what a special event is. That, that's what really has me uh, troubled here. Councilor Harris. And uh, to make this more complex, um, <laughs> Would it be appropriate under R270-1980 to consider the fact that the zoning code is, that the property has been sort of upzoned um, in terms of what's beneficial for the neighborhood or what's appropriate for the neighborhood? Um, you're saying no. Mr. President, Councilor Harris, I'm glad you asked that question because um, looking at interpreting R270-1980, um, it deals with the impacts of the zone and the relative appropriateness of the proposed zone compared to the prior. So we're in sort of a weird era right now where we have a little bit of overlap between IDO and the zone code. And so while I think it's appropriate for you to think about um, sort of the, the outcome that would happen in the event that this zoning isn't ultimately approved, um, it's not appropriate to, to any of the criteria under R270-1980 um, what the IDO did. One more thing is that Go and proceed. Um, the EPC, the one thing I don't think I'm in support of uh, the president's motion, because I don't know if I am, but maybe Mr. Melenders can help me, is it seems like the EPC was pretty darn specific. And our hearing officer did not say remanded. Our hearing officer said they're just flat out wrong, reverse them. So a remand seems like not the right move here. Okay, well, we have a motion and a second on the floor to uphold the Luho's decision, including recommendations and findings. All those in favor, raise your hand and say yes. Yes. Those opposed, say no. That, all those in favor again, raise your hand, please. There's four in the affirmative. All those opposed? And there's four in the negative. That dies. 
uh, then I will move that we remand this back to the EPC to try to clarify this issue. Mr. President, if I may suggest um, some, a couple of, of items about what you'd want the EPC to clarify, um, and, and if it, I would suggest that it be um, to clarify its analysis of the test under R270-1980 about the existing zoning being more appropriate because a different zoning is more advantageous or because of change conditions or because there was a mistake in the original zoning. Also to clarify its findings relative to what type of use it's approving, whether it's the uh, enumerated bed and breakfast use or whether it's a, a special specific use, the B35 use as was described. And finally, to consider conditions on the use um, to limit the special events. Councilor Pena. Thank you, Mr. President. So, so a quick question for, for clarity. Could we ask for, because apparently it already allows for, so I, I feel like if we're, we do this, we're going to set um, precedents in terms of bed and breakfasts all over the city of Albuquerque because they do have a provision for a special event without really having a definition for special event and us saying that this particular zone can or can't have X amount or what it is that they can have or how many people they can have, I think it sets a terrible precedent. So is there any way that we can go back and ask for what the intent or what the what special event, how it's defined, maybe? Uh, Mr. President, Councilor Penny, if, if you remand, I think so. And um, one of the, I think I identified three points that the EPC would probably want to deal with on your remand, and, and the last one spoke to that, maybe not as directly as you just did, um, but essentially to identify what they think a special event would be um, and limit it to those uh, per, per the special use zoning at this site. Mr. President, because I feel that we're going to be treating all of these cases on a case-by-case -case basis, and I don't necessarily think that that's fair to the people who have these bed and breakfasts. Mr. President, Councilor Pena, I think moving forward, whatever zoning action happens at this particular site under the application that's before you will be unique to this particular site. So even if the EPC identifies what a special event here is, it won't necessarily translate to what constitutes a special event under the IDO. That's probably something that's just going to have to shake out as we administer the IDO over time. Councilor Benton. That was the question I was going to ask. I mean, ultimately, uh, between the administration and then ourselves, uh, we're sort of the final decider on a definition problem within the IDO. Um, so could we not tackle that as a separate action? Mr. President, Councilor Benton, um, you could, and there are probably a couple of ways to tackle that. Um, the first is um, through an, uh, an amendment to the IDO, perhaps as part of the cleanup that we're all anticipating to happen over time. Um, and the second is what comes before you regularly, which is um, a disagreement with the zoning enforcement officer's determination about what a special event may or may not be and how it's complying with zoning, in which case this body would be specifically charged with kind of settling that dispute as to what constitutes a special event. So those are the two ways that the council could deal with it, one a little more proactive than the other. And Mr. 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 President, the, the, uh, if it were to go out back on remand and we asked the EPC as one of the conditions to define it in this case only, uh, that would be another option. Mr. President, Councilor Benton, yes, and I, and I apologize if I wasn't being clear, but that's what I was suggesting, uh, to, attempting to suggest as part of the conditions of your remand, if you s move in that direction. Because we, we really don't want the, the EPC making changes to uh, the new zoning code. Mr. President, Councilor Benton, they can't, not without your approval. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second on the floor to remand this back to the EPC with the recommendations by our city council attorney and specifically to this particular issue. All those in favor signify by saying yes. Yeah. Yes. All those opposed? That carries unanimously. Okay, we are done with the appeal. We are back on approvals and now back to item C. That is EC 166. Uh, Mayor's recommendation of Diron Murphy Architects PC, Architectural Consultants for Dennis Chavez Community Center, Phase 2, and John Marshall's Health and Social Service Center. I move approval. We have a motion and a second. Are there any questions? 
Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying yes. Yes, those opposed say no. That carries unanimously. Uh, we are now under final actions. Uh, we are on item B. Councillor Benton, O-22. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, O-22 is approving a project involving InfoMedia Group in Incorporated the, doing business as CareNet Healthcare Services pursuant to the LIDA Act and City Ordinance FS-00410 to support the renovation and construction of a 23,452 square foot of commercial rental space in downtown Albuquerque and related improvements for a healthcare customer call service center. I move a due pass. We have a motion and a second by Councillor Harris and we have one individual that has signed up to speak, Deborah Inman. Thank you for hanging in there and staying with us. Welcome. <laughs> My pleasure. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. President and fellow members of the City Council. My name is Deborah Inman. I'm Senior Vice President of Business Development at Albuquerque Economic Development. AED began working with CareNet Healthcare Services in August of 2017. CareNet's selection of an office in downtown area will further help to drive the city's efforts to revitalize its downtown. Scott Throckmorton and his partners were instrumental to the success of this project. They are making significant tenant improvements at the office space located at 303 Roma and 504th Street, which the company will occupy. CareNet is headquartered in San Antonio, Texas, and has been in business for over 30 years. They will create 233 jobs over the next three years, generating an annual payroll of $6.4 million at full build-out. These patient care representatives will educate, empower, and motivate members of over 100 healthcare organizations. Additionally, in light of the passage of the ENLC Nursing Compact during this year's legislative session, New Mexico is now positioned for another arm of CareNet's operations, telenursing. While the company has not made any commitments specific to hiring nursing, or nurses, excuse me, for its telenursing services, we are confident that Albuquerque will now be able to compete internally for future opportunities in this area. Keep in mind, these would be positions for individuals that may not want to work in the nursing environment that would be more typical, which could be hospitals and or medical offices. We are excited that CareNet's new employees will bring additional revenues to existing restaurants and shops downtown. There's also the likelihood that some of their employees will take advantage of the affordable housing opportunities that exist in the downtown area today and are planned for in the near future. AED respectfully requests the Council's approval of the LIDA Ordinance and Project Participation Agreement before you today for CareNet Healthcare Services. Thank you, Ms. Simmons. Councillor Benton? So uh, I think this was uh, characterized in the write-up as a call center, and it technically is a call center, but it sounds like much more than that in terms of uh, the potential for telenursing, telemedicine. Certainly for the potential. Keep in mind that CareNet does have offices, um, obviously in San Antonio, Texas, um, and they do have a telenursing component to their operations. So the original, the initial operation is that of, yes, a uh, customer service center for assistance of individuals in over 100 different healthcare plans. It also better positions, or now we are better positioned, to be able to compete for further expansions that CareNet may have within its operations, which could include the telenursing component. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ms. President, just uh, I wanted to say that uh, Ms. Firth is here, if there's, and she's offered uh, if there are any questions also yes. with regard to the application. And we also have the company representative, the president of the company, um, uh, Mick Mosher, is also here. If to the Thank you. Still Thank you. Councilor Gibson. Thank you, Mr. President. So I have to ask, uh, are there clawbacks? And can you tell us about the clawbacks? <laughs> and is there a wage clawback? Uh, good evening, Mr. President and uh, counselors. Um, yes, indeed, as all, all of the LIDA projects that we bring before the council have both performance clawbacks and also uh, facility closure clawbacks. And this one is um, no different than any of the others that you've seen before. Go ahead and proceed. So um, with the uh, uh, 
employment, uh, the staffing. Um, can you can you just kind of describe that for us? What the uh, requirements are and uh, yes, uh, Mr. President and uh, Councilors, um, CareNet um, will be employing 233 um, customer service and um, other individuals at their site in downtown. I'm just looking for the project participation agreement right here. I know you've got one. I do. So um, in terms of the um, facility closure clawbacks, um, they are required to pay um, within the first five years, 100% of the public contributions would need to be repaid. Um, that uh, graduates down to 60% um, and down to 10% over the 10-year time frame of the um, facility. In addition, um, they are required to maintain at least um, 200 and, uh, let's see here, 10 full-time jobs. Um, and they are required um, also, um, we will be monitoring the wages. Um, they were required to pay at least 50% of the benefits the health care benefits of the employees as well. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Councillor Harris. Uh, thank you, Ms. First. And I'm looking at, but I don't have time to completely analyze. I think it's page 12 of the PPA. And it says hiring schedule. And it looks like, are we there? Is it 11 or 12? Uh, which section, sir? I think it's, it says, I thought it's the PPA. It says it's um, page 11 of something that's attached to the. Okay. Uh, what's, what, what's the thing called here? Councilor Harris, if you yeah. would, uh, I'm looking okay. at the clock in front of me and it says 10.05, but the correct time is 10.25. Uh, okay. So I'm going to make the request to suspend the rules and extend the meeting till 10.45. Second. We have a motion and a second by Councilor Jones. All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 Those opposed say no. Go ahead and proceed. So it's going to be Article 3, Section 7, Jobs. Mr. President and uh, Councillor Harris, I'm with you. Okay. And then it has a hiring schedule and it has actual, uh, looks like it has wages there. Or is that clawbackable? It looks like it has a gross annual wage. Um, Mr. President and Councillor Harris, um, the way that the performance uh, measurements are set up. Um, the wages are monitored each year. The wages themselves are not clawbackable, I guess, in, in that regard, but we do monitor those each year, and it is the um, number of jobs that um, have performance clawbacks attached to them. Okay, so, so it's kind of the same thing. It's the number of jobs, not the number of jobs in combination with the wages. Um, Mr. Uh, President and Councillor Harris, that is correct. Okay, thank you. Councillor Pena? Okay. Any other questions? We'll go back to Councillor Gibson and then Councillor Pena. Do you want me to close? No, you're not sponsoring the bill. It's uh, Councilor Benton, but <laughs> yeah, I didn't think so. I think, well, Kayla, that you wanted your, uh, to ask questions. No, I, I got my questions answered. Thank you, Councilor Benton. Thank you, Ms. Ruth. Okay, let's go ahead and go to Councilor Benton to close. Urge your support. We have a motion and a second for approval of O-22. All those in favor, raise your hand and say yes. 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 Those opposed, that carries unanimously. Thank you. We are now on item C, Councillor Gibson and Councillor Borrego, R-31. Councillor Gibson. Thank you. One second, let me <coughs> catch up. Yes, if you would. Councillor Borrego. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is making an appropriation in FY... Oh, yes, Making yes. an appropriation... 
appropriation in FY18 from the unspent, unspent unencumbered funds within the general fund, 110 for the Mariachi Spectacular de Albuquerque, um, and I move a due pass. We have a motion and a second by Councillor Gibson. Are there any questions? Councillor Gibson to close. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I would appreciate your support in passing this and uh, helping this really good organization um, uh, do some of the education work that they would like to do. And we did have a representative here earlier, but it got late and she had to go. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Borrego, any more closing comments? Um, you know, I spoke at length with them regarding how they could sort of reach out, as I did with a lot of other programs, um, to some of our respective districts. And um, this group is already reaching out with our youth. And I think that's, you know, that's something that we should be looking for in the future, especially in our respective districts that are on the outskirts to ensure that we have, um, we, we all sort of take advantage of some of the programs um, and our youth is, our, our youth are affected by, in a positive way by these programs. So thank you, I ask you to support this. Okay, we have a motion and a second on the floor for R-31. Any questions? All those in favor, signify by saying yes. 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 Those opposed say no. That carries unanimously. Uh, we are now on item D. Floor substitute R-32, Councillor Benton. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'll ask for uh, administration's comment on this. We uh, had introduced this as just to kind of keep uh, a fire lit, and I think we lit the fire pretty well, and, and the administration has moved along rapidly in, uh, in uh, getting the uh, RFP out. And so all this is really doing now is uh, affirming a deadline, I believe, that my understanding has already been set by the Mortgage Finance Authority, and then uh, doing a little bit of cleanup on, on some funding for uh, this project, this single site supportive housing project. But uh, if the administration has any objection, uh, I'd like to hear it, but otherwise I'd move it due pass. We have a motion and a second. Any questions? See none. Councilor Benton, close. Uh, again, this this will um, will require that the uh, that we have a recommendation, which I think we're going to be very close to having a recommendation uh, by our first meeting in August, so that uh, so that we can uh, approve a project in in August in time for the MFA deadline. So I urge your support. I apologize, we have one individual signed up to speak and that is Tad Naminsky. Thank you, my name is Tad Naminsky again. <clears throat> well, here is a, um, uh, I, I've been, dealing with this issue, not personally, but observing people in downtown area over the years, and also being involved at here city council meetings. Doesn't matter how, look at just, anyone knows how many people on the street, year after year. It's, do we have any improvement where this money goes? And most people just simply won't want to stay in the house. Just prefer to be on the street. They do not. So anyway, doesn't matter how much you put to the system, we have no accountability. Because all there also housing only just lately being built of 60 units apartment on the 4th Street, only five for Section 8. So, and how many mil millions been spent for every, every dose of projects? No, these people, mental health, they belong to hospital, not in jail. They used to belong in jail. Now, jail is unpopulated. So they are on the street with criminals before in jail. So anyway, here is we need some accountability. 
and they belong in hospitals. Simply as that. What, what's happened to Las Lunas Hospital? They cl closed it. State hospital. Your time has expired, Las We have a motion and a second on the floor for floor substitute R-32. All those in favor signify by saying yes. Yes, those opposed say no. That carries unanimously. Uh, Councillor Betton, R-42. Thank you, Mr. President. R-42 is declaring the intent of the city subject to satisfaction of certain conditions to issue metropolitan redevelopment bonds in an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $30 million in connection with the acquisition, construction, and equipping of the Bank of the West Center project. I move it do pass. We have a motion and a second. Are there any questions? Seeing none, Councillor Betton to close. I urge your support. All those in favor of R-42, signify by saying yes. 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 yes, those opposed say no, that carries unanimously. Uh, we are now under item F, that is R-45, that is approving and authorizing the filing of a grant application and the acceptance of potential grant awards for multiple transit department programs from the Federal Transit Administration of the U.S. Department of Transportation and providing for an appropriation of the trans transit department. I move a due pass. We have a motion and a second. Are there any questions? Mr. President, I just want to point out that Mr. Toon has sat here this evening since 5 o'clock for this very small last-minute item, and I think his uh, commitment to the job should be acknowledged. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Councillor Davis. All those in favor of R-45, raise your hand and say yes. 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 Those opposed say no. That carries unanimously. And we are now on the final item, which is item G, R-46. That is approving and authorizing the acceptance of FY16 2014 Geo bonds from the state of New Mexico for public libraries and the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Library System and providing for an appropriation to the Cultural Services Department in fiscal year 2018. I move a due pass. Okay. We have a motion and a second by Councillor Pena. Are there any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying yes. Yes, yes those opposed say no. If there is no further business before this council, this meeting is adjourned.